they focus some few enhancements and some modifications many will be happy with. But first I'd like to tell you again a little review on why I use these power supplies. I'm using a different module, much smaller. So this is actually a capacitive power supply and these are my preferred power supplies because they're essentially transformerless. Now there are many consumer devices now and I've spent a lot of time explaining the advantage of reactive power supplies here. And essentially what happens here is a good part Basically what, what happens is that it limits the current with reactive ohms and that's a very efficient way because it's a capacitive effect. So in other words, if your input is asking for more, it's not going to strain the capacitive power supply because it's actually restricted by the capacitor's dynamics. So it doesn't resist it in a form of heat as in normal circuits. So you're not losing it here as resistance. It's just giving you the maximum it can. So very efficient way to run your circuits. And with that said, what's interesting with reactive power is it's actually, in part, let's say we limit this to, um, this one here is actually just 4 volts, 1 amp, that's it. Now because of this displacement current, because what happens in an LC circuit, you get this ping pong action, and this is what's going on. And a part of this goes back into the grid. And the thing is, folks, before you all get all fussy like this is oh geez a way to get free energy not really i'll explain it um it makes it more efficient and especially if you're running your own generators now yes granted a small part of this not the whole thing but let's say maybe 20 percent if it because in theory in theory it would be 100 but it never is you know because of resistance and things like that so let's say even 20 percent of it so true displacement currents between the ping pong you get that additional system and the displacement current adds up so it becomes part of that um integrated into that maximum of one amp so again that's maximum doesn't mean my circuit takes it but this is what it will be able to provide. Now in reality this little oscillator from a plasma lamp takes about half an amp. So about half of the capacity of what this transformer can, well transformer-ish, because there is a switching circuit inside, a small DC switching circuit. But it is driven by a capacitive stage so it's transformerless on the AC input side. Now the thing is these are basically residential devices. Anyone can buy them and use them and there is a tolerance on the line. This is something really crazy because on the AC lines folks they have to take an, into account the P factor which is power and then they also have to take account the S which is the apparent power which is essentially all that reflected. So basically the grid has to withstand basically double of what it's putting out or else the components within the grid, the LC circuits, could blow up. So even though we're not using the apparent power on the grid, the grid itself still needs to account for all the possible apparent power it can have on the grid. So essentially, in industrial applications where there's a lot of reactive power, meaning bounce back into the grid, the electric company is in it to make money. So they don't actually shut these people down. They just end up charging them a premium for it because essentially, in their view, they end up straining the grid without any real benefits because they don't actually bill a parent power transfer, even though it's circulating within the grid all the time as a side effect. So there it is, your admission rate right from the electric company that reactive power once bounced back into the grid as, as apparent power could actually do real work in the form of any kind of, the circuits see it as regular electricity. Their tolerance values can be exceeded, they'll generate heat and they'll blow up. But in traditional circuits we totally ignore it and we don't use that kind of energy. But what I'm getting at is if you were to build your homemade much stronger, more capacitive supplies, if the mains would find out, again, they're not in it to shut you down, but they'd just throw their service agreement at you and then charge you a premium because they think you're doing something non-standard for, for residential usage and then they'll just charge you more. So what I'm getting at is at the end of the day, if you have a big system just with a capacitive power supply that gives you one kilowatts of power, have no fear, the mains people will come after you and charge you a premium for it. They'll let you do it, but they'll just charge you for it. So at the end of the day, because of the quote unquote penalty fee, you're not any ahead of yourself. So it is best if you are to use this on the mains anyways, if you have your own generators, you don't have to worry about it. But on the mains, as long as you stick to industrial certified commercial 
residential use applications, which already passed the certifications, they have all the tolerance levels at the industries, they know what's accepted and certified, so you don't have to worry about it and you can use it. So very efficient because not only does it drop it to an amp, but a part of that amp gets bounced back into the grid. So it gives me maybe 20% more efficiency on top of that one amp that I'm only using. That's what I'm getting at. So now back to the system, I used a smaller oscillator, which seems to work as well, from a plasma lamp. And I decided over here instead to try with a regular fluorescent tube, but I made some modifications to make it work well. Now I have the capacitor plates, which is two aluminum foils, so one plate is here, the other is there. And what I did is, I got my dielectric is the tape in the middle. But in between that sandwich is my coil. All you can see it kind of in there. And I use iron to make it because I want to stick to two different metals. And because iron is ferroelectric, I figured either it's going to hum more, give me some heat, or it's going to enhance. Who knows? So I figured I'd try it. So anyways, what I'm doing here is I've got one capacitor plate going first into the um, coil and out to another capacitor plate. So this is my capacitor output. So same thing here, full bridge rectifier. So we feed the oscillator directly into the lamp's input here. And the output over there goes into the AC in of the rectifier. The second AC just goes to a floating ground here that's connected to nothing. Very important to make this happen. And then what I did here is I added what seems to work really well is the microwave capacitor in parallel with the filtering capacitor. So what I have here is the plates here go to the filtering each side as well. So it's also the filtering capacitor. And the coil also helps with resonance. Now what's interesting, people might say tuning, tuning, tuning. Well, some advantage of running these very simple flyback well, I call them flyback, but these very simple self-running oscillators as their tendency to self-tune themselves to whatever it is you're putting in their LC circuits. So whatever you put on the output, the device will either speed up or slow down, run at the pulse that it's optimal, and it tunes itself literally to the optimal frequency that all of this runs in. So I don't have to worry about resonance. The oscillator actually tunes itself to the most resonant point of this whole system as a whole, as a bonus. So keeping it very simple in that aspect. So what I notice here again, because we only have like 20 PF here, which could be maybe not that much, right? So what I've done is I've put them in, in parallel. Sorry, I've yeah, in parallel. So what happens here is this um, gives me a little bit more capacitance. So what I'm going to do here is I have the 9 volt battery that's basically dead here. So you see 2.96 volts. But first I'm going to disconnect it and turn it on to show you how fast that capacitor charges. So there's the meter there. Still got a residual from the battery. So we're going to turn this on here and look at the meter. So instantly, and it works better the more you load the ground. So if you could actually find a real ground, this jumps to like four or 500. But just to keep things simple here, I want to show you the effect. So everything's running quiet, everything's running, and you can even see a bit of the plasma lighting up there. Well, plasma, fluorescent lamp. So we see the high voltage. So I'm going to shut this off now, and I'm going to plug in our 9-volt battery. You'll see the charge go back up, 2.9. I'm going to bring the meter down here. And I'm going to turn it on and see how fast this charges. So now we're on. Look how fast. So what's happening here is the capacitor is much less impedance than the battery, so it can eat up the additional energy and this takes care of our um, filtering and it energizes our dielectrics so it essentially fills in those holes faster with a high intensity energy field so it's a tri-function and of course look how fast it's charging the battery the battery is higher impedance so it then dumps the charge into the battery nicely and this is running even faster than my first demonstration and i'm running at half the power so with these 
simple modifications, I was able to make it work with just a regular fluorescent tube. Now again, like I said, I could speed this up even if I load the uh, spare AC side with a one wire lamp. Just because what's happening here, folks, is it's the displacement current because it's a one wire going across the lamp and out through the rectifier and as a floating ground. This creates a, a very modest displacement current. It gives you a potential, but not a very um, strong power-wise potential. Power comes from the filtering capacitor where all the holes are getting filled into the dielectric. So this one gives you the power and the displacement gives you the voltage, if you can understand that. So if you want more voltage, you ground to a real ground, you get more displacement current and the, and the fields fill up the holes here through the capacitor filtering. Let's see how quick that's charging. 3.7 already. So very efficient setup. And again, this is a non-rechargeable battery, but alkaline, if you um, supervise it properly, it will charge. And this is a very dead battery. I just wanted to show you how it responds. So we'll see if we can get it to about 4 volts and then I will um, cut this video short. But this is essentially it. This powers very low voltage, 4 volts, about half a nm. This is drawing, feeding the tube. The tube going in through the AC's rectifier, AC side. The other side is just a floating ground. And our capacitive plates over here connects to the filter cap side of the rectifier and that's charging your battery and this microwave capacitor is just in line as well with the DC output to help 